started officially, Aparna? Sounds great. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Lowers. I'm the founder of BirdBrain Technologies. We're a small robotics company in Pittsburgh that makes uh, educational robots to inspire deep and joyful learning for all students. And uh, we do that with our products, the Finch Robot and the Hummingbird Robotics Kit. Today, we're going to be talking all about the Finch and how you can use it in uh, elementary school and middle school especially, but also in high school to teach com computational thinking and computer science. But before I dive into the presentation, I also want to um, uh, introduce Aparna. So Aparna, you wanna say hi? Hello, uh, hello from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for having us uh, at the CS for Georgia Summit. We are really excited to be here and to introduce you to the Finch Robot. Um, we are a tiny company, so the way people hear about us is from things like this and from trying out our products with our free demo program and educators. So if you have any questions while Tom is talking, I will be manning the chat. So feel free to throw your comments or questions in there, and we will try to get all of your questions answered. Thanks for being here. Yep, thank you. Um, all right, so just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. So I've got the link to the slides there and, and Aparna will put that in the chat. I'm gonna introduce you to the Finch Robot 2.0, kind of give you like a five minute overview of what it's about. And then I'll take a deep dive into two of the learning materials that we have. One for uh, an app called Finch Blocks, which is appropriate for kind of kindergarten to third grade. And then another for a programming environment called SNAP, which is really appropriate for fourth to eighth graders. Um, we're then going to talk about the loan program, uh, which is a program where you can apply to borrow sets of robots, as well as our demo program, where you can essentially get a 60-day trial of, of either the Finch or the Hummingbird kit. Um, if we have time, and I think we will have some time for this, we're going to have a, uh, some time where you can program the robots that are here in the live stream learning studio with me, um, where you can program them over the internet. So that's a capability that we've um, added since the pandemic began. It is actually something that you can do. It's something that you can, you know, if you have finches at your own, um, your own school, you can set them up to be rem remotely programmable over the internet. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it works and then I'm also going to let you guys try it. So you will have probably 10 to 20 minutes where you're actually programming robots virtually, but as basically in, a, in as hands-on a fashion as, as you can get in this kind of virtual environment. So hopefully we'll have a, a good amount of time for, for playing around with the robots. Okay, so the Finch robot. Um, the Finch robot 2.0 is actually the second generation of our Finch uh, robot product line. Uh, the original version was developed at Carnegie Mellon way back in 2008, 2009, 2010 uh, to be an engaging tool for computer science education. And the research was really focused at the time on high school and college. And that's because back in 2008, nobody was talking about you know, coding with third graders, much less kindergarten students. Um, so we developed the Finch and we launched it and we've had 10 years of feedback from educators about what they liked and disliked about the original Finch. And a couple of years ago, you know, the sort of accelerating uh, technologies and uh, capabilities, got, it got to the point where we realized that we could do a compelling hardware redesign of the Finch, which was very exciting because we could address um, all of the things, all of the feedback that we'd heard from teachers using the original Finch over the last 10 years. And so that got us to today, where we have a new Finch robot out. It's been uh, released since December. And it's all about, again, same mission, bringing computer science and computational thinking to life for students, being an engaging tool for those things. But now we can do this all the way from kindergarten, all the way up to college. And I'm going to kind of explain how, how we managed to, um, to reach that very wide audience of, of ages and also experience levels. We basically do it by supporting lots of different programming environments. Um, so here's, you know, here, our, our approach is basically that we are, um, you know, low floor, high ceiling. So what does that mean? It means that an absolute beginner can, be, can 
pick up a Finch, they're five years old, they've never seen a robot or, or written any code, and they can start moving the robot around and writing, writing small algorithms, short algorithms for that robot. Um, at the same time, you can have a high school student in an APCSA class pick up the Finch and learn recursion with it, or learn about objects with it, or learn some high-level computer science concepts with it. So this low floor, high ceiling approach allows us to address this wide range of age and experience levels. Um, the two images I've got up here, you know, these, these, these are basically two programs, one in Finchblocks, one in Java, and they do the same thing. My point here is like this, this is the exact same behavior. The robot's gonna go forward and go backwards. Now in Java, you can do much more complicated behaviors than in Finchblocks, but that's sort of the carrot for students to keep learning, right? Um, so as they learn more, they can do more interesting things with the robot. Um, so I'm going to talk about Finch blocks in depth and actually show you the learning materials. But if you want to look at it yourself, um, there's a, one version of it is actually a web app and a partner will put the URL to it in the chat. You can click on that and you can actually see the interface and kind of play around with it. Uh, so this is our app for um, kindergarten to third grade. Right now it works on Android, iOS, Chromebooks, and shortly it will work on Windows and Mac as well. So pretty much cr cross-platform. And even within this app, we've decided to do some scaffolding. Um, so you know, in level one, students get very much like atomic blocks that just move the finch forward or turn it 90 degrees or turn the beak red. In level two, they actually get the ability to uh, like change the parameter of those blocks. So instead of go forward, it's go forward 10 centimeters, turn 60 degrees or 30 degrees. And then in level three, they actually get some control structures. So they get loops and they get wait and tills and they get events. So they actually are starting to understand these more complicated uh, computer science um, concepts. As you move kind of to uh, sort of the next uh, set of students that we try to support. So like fourth to eighth grade, we've provided a number of different um, blocks programming environments. So Bird Blocks is our tablet app. It works on iOS and Android. Um, and uh, you know it allows students to, to use those tablets to control the robot. Snap, which is something that is similar to what you'll be using later today to program the robots remotely, is a live coding environment for um, for computers, so for laptops, Windows, Mac, Chromebooks. Uh, and what's important, you know, I, I said it's live coding. What I mean by that is when you click on a block, uh, you can instantly see the results. So you can set, you know, you can create a, a group of blocks, you can snap them together, you can click on that, and then you can see your robot do exactly what you, what you clicked on. Um, and that's important because it allows for play and exploration in a way that, you know, that you can't do something like wrong or something bad, right? Like you can do something that may be conceptually incorrect, but you could, whatever you do, you will instantly see that result. And then you can adjust and iterate based on what you're seeing. Uh, lastly, we have MakeCode, which is the environment that is used by the microbit. And it is a blocks environment that compiles down to the Finch. So that means that it runs autonomously. It runs, the Finch runs independently once it has MakeCode on it. Um, but what's really cool about it is that it has a blocks to text transitional kind of switch. So you can assemble a blocks program, you can hit that switch and you can see it in Python or JavaScript syntax. And I think that's really good for students who are just at that point where you're trying to get them to transition into, into Python or Java, which we also support. So we support standard Python, you know, Python 3 that you'd run on, uh, on your computer and we support standard Java, and we do that over uh, kind of a Bluetooth link. Uh, and for, for these environments, Python works on Chromebooks, Windows, and Mac. Java right now, just Windows and Mac uh, laptops. All right, so in terms of the features of the robot, you know, it has wheels, so obviously can drive forward. Those wheels have encoders, so you can tell it to uh, go forward 10 centimeters, turn 90 degrees. It can move pretty accurately. It has a centrally, uh, centrally located pen hole or marker hole. So you can put a marker through the finch and then have it draw on, uh, on a table or you know, probably on some butcher paper or something like that. Um, 
In terms of other outputs, it has a full color LED in the beak, four full color LEDs near the tail, and then this five by five grid of LEDs, red LEDs that are in the tail. That LED array is really great for uh, emojis, expressiveness. You can also scroll uh, messages across it, and you can definitely read letters and numbers that are scrolling across that display. Uh, finally, it has a buzzer, so you can make like 8-bit Nintendo style, 1980s Nintendo style uh, music on the Finch. Uh, that's actually what my kids often love to do is make it kind of make it into a musical instrument. Uh, and then it has um, some pips for snapping, uh, let's say, your favorite plastic bricks to the, to the Finch, so you can kind of build on top of it. In terms of inputs, it has um, line tracking sensors, so it can follow a line. It has a distance sensor, so it can avoid obstacles. It has two light sensors to um, basically follow a flashlight beam, a compass, uh, so it can always drive north or west or east, uh, an accelerometer, three axis, so you can pick it up and turn it into kind of like a Wiimote style interface. And then it has a couple of buttons. Um, also, they are all wireless and they can talk to one another. So in most of our environments, you can link up to three robots to one program. Uh, and then in MakeCode, you can actually have like a swarm of robots, like 20 robots all talking to one another. So that's kind of a cool thing there. Um, so when you say work, so somebody has a question about Chromebooks. Um, so actually, uh, it depends a little on the implementation. But in general, our Chromebook implementations are web apps that run in the browser. They're not Android apps that have been converted. Um, so that's kind of the, the fast answer to that. Oh, great question about versions of micro bits. <laughs> OK. Uh, so yeah, Aparna mentions we work with both. So version one and version two, if you if you know about the micro bit, the micro bit is the little circuit board in the tail of the finch. And it uh, it essentially runs the robot. Um, very recently, micro, the micro bit foundation came out with the version two micro bit. Um, so we have adapted all of our software and hardware so that it works with both version one and two. The nice thing about version two and the thing that is most useful for the Finch is that it actually adds a microphone, like a new sound sensor. So you, you can do fun things with the version two micro bit, like you clap and make the robot go forward when you're clapping or something like that. Um, so just a, a, a last few things. I mentioned that we integrated lots of feedback from educators about the original Finch. One of those things was, what is the most common way that the Finch fails in your class? And the most common way was somebody stepped on it. Um, so you can see in this video, you can see me stepping on the robot because we built in like a spring system so that if you step on the finch, it's fine. Uh, if it falls off a table, you know, it should be fine. It should be able to handle that. Um, it has a battery life that lasts for the whole day. It's really intended that you would charge it overnight and then use it in every period of the day. It'll be fine. It lasts at least seven hours. Uh, and then the last thing which I'm going to show you is it comes with lots of free learning materials. The way we think about um, our products in general is that they are, you know, there's there are ways to facilitate learning experiences. And so the product can't just be hardware or even hardware and software. It has to include curriculum activities and professional development. And we try to make as much of that free uh, for you as possible. So we've got free activities, free asynchronous PD uh, and student facing tutorials as well. OK, so let's oh. all right. So let's talk a little bit more about those learning materials. Uh, and I'm going to focus first on Finch Blocks because it's what we would recommend for younger elementary students. And I know some of you on the call are, um, are teaching in kindergarten, first or second grade. Um, so let's click through there. So this is sort of a standard way that all of our supported programming environments have kind of a, a landing page like this, where you've got step-by-step -step tutorials in the programming tab, activities that you can use in your classroom, and resources that you can use as well that, that may be helpful. So let's look at the step-by-step -step tutorials for Finch Blocks. So they'll take you through you know, setting up for iOS, Android, or Fire tablets, or for Chromebooks, and then, you know, They'll tell you, OK, here's level one. Here's movement. How do I make my Finch move in level one? Um, 
So you can use these tutorials to kind of click through and get a step-by-step -step guide of what you need to do. Um, and that's, that's basically how the, these programming tutorials are set up. In terms of activities, you know, I mentioned the Finch Blocks has three levels in it. So these activities are, um, are leveled in the same way. So let's say that I've taught my kids uh, how to use level one in Finch Blocks. What can I do with them? Okay, well, we can have them follow, a, like program the robot to follow a maze. We can have them joust with the robots. We can have them draw a shape or do a dance party. Uh, here's what we can do with level two. Here's what we can do with level three. And then if I click through one of these, right? And you'll notice some of these activities are actually listed in multiple levels. That's because you can do kind of multiple more advanced things as the levels go up. So it's the same idea. You have it draw a shape, but you know, in, in level one, really you can only draw squares and rectangles because of the way the blocks are set up. In level two, though, you could draw a hexagon with sides of 10 centimeters, right? And in level three, you can use loops, which are very helpful when you're drawing a, rec a regular shape. Um, if you need access to, um, you know, essentially the, the code that we used uh, or code like sample code that we've written for as solutions to these, you can do that. You can, it's hidden behind this get access. Um, we basically, you know, you can register and we'll send you an access code. The reason we did this is so that, um, especially for older students, that we don't inadvertently give away like sample code that solves the problems uh, that you may be assigning to them in class. Um, so we, we have a registration system and we do actually check that you are a teacher. Like we have you fill out um, a form that, you know, links to like the staff registration, like the staff um, directory, or, you know, you have to use like an educational um, email address to register. Um, okay, so that's the activities. And then the resource pages are actually the same for all of our programming environments. So regardless of which environment you are in, it's going to take you to the same resource kind of catch-all page. Um, we have you know, some printable resources like the Finch2 blocks in different programming environments. Uh, you'll notice there's a new resource here on a 3D printable phone cradle. So that's something that you can print and then mount to your Finch, and then you can basically put a phone on the Finch with a rubber band, which is fun because you can use that like a GoPro, right? You can you can record a video while your student has programmed the Finch to do something. You can have it record a video and then play the video back to them. That's something that's going to entertain them probably even at the kindergarten level. Uh, you can do some more advanced things with that as well. Like we have app libraries, so if you're at the high school end and you want them to to create an app for the Finch while the the uh, while their phone sits on the Finch, you can do that. Uh, and then we have lots of classroom support. So you know, I've talked about how you can make these Finches remotely programming programmable over the internet. There's a tutorial for how to do that. There's some short shortcuts. There's a reading list. Our reading list um, is very well curated. Aparna actually puts it together and and she and her daughter like read every book that goes on that list. Um, so it's just a very good guide for, you know, putting some um, or recommending some computer science or computational thinking themed books to your students or possibly to their parents. Uh, and then the, the last few resources here that I want to show you, like the grants page is a is a grant guide as well as grant opportunities where you can find um, funding support to you know to purchase some Finch robots. Um, the standards guide will show you kind of some standards alignment with the Finches, and then the online PD courses here. Uh, I do want to click through that because I mentioned that we have done asynchronous video PD uh, for many of our programming environments. So you know if you want a if you want to follow along with something that is live, um, we have a course for Finch Blocks. We have one for Snap and Bird Blocks and Make Code. Basically, everything icon or blocks based. Um, and so, when you look at this course, it comes with ten videos. Um, the Finch Blocks PD. They're about five minutes long each. They're going to take you through setup, and then they're going to take you through um, how to, you know, move the Finch, use its LED light. 
LED lights, use sound, use sensors, but in the context of also teaching computational thinking concepts. So it's a really nice mixture of, you know, how do I make my robot go? And um, more deeply, how do I integrate that and explain computational thinking to my students with this robot? So I highly recommend uh, if you have a Finch or if you borrow a Finch from us, following along with these uh, PD videos. And that is a quick overview of Finch blocks and sort of the resources there. I'll do the same a bit shorter overview for, for SNAP. Um, so again, our step-by-step -step video tutorials, our activities and our resources. The resources page is the same, so I'm not gonna go there. But in terms of our programming activities, right? So with blocks-based programming, you know, you can actually do much more than you can with just Finch blocks. And so the way we've structured these, these are really meant for your students to follow along with. Um, you know, you go through setup and then you focus on the outputs. So we teach them how to use the motors, the LEDs, the, the, uh, the buzzer. And then we start getting into inputs. And once you start getting into inputs, you really start getting into some computer science concepts, right? Because you need to know how to use a conditional statement or a branching statement. You need to know how to use a variable or Boolean logic or, um, or a loop. And so as they're learning about sensors, they're also picking up those concepts. And then, you know, if you like, we can go even further. So once they've even learned how to use the Finch, Finch's sensors and outputs, you want to also teach them more complex behaviors, right? So you want to introduce some ideas like random numbers, variables, lists. So lists of, vari uh, of, of uh, data. Um, timers, so time, modularity, like you can even go into recursion. You can actually have them learn recursion with this blocks-based programming environment, which is something that often doesn't come up until the end of a freshman college year, like college course. Um, so again, these, these modules, we have them for all of the blocks-based programming environments. Um, and then the activities, kind of match those. So the beginner activities are designed so that they can be done once they've learned the things in the outputs. The intermediate activities require them to learn from the sensors tutorials, and then the advanced requires some of the concepts in, um, in going further. The other thing I wanna point out is like, they're linked back and forth. So at the end of the moving and turning lesson or tutorial, it will take you to three different activities that you can do having to use or practice what you've just learned about moving and turning the Finch. So it's not like you have to wait until you've done all of the outputs activities before you or outputs tutorials before you can do any of the beginner activities in the activities space. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit more about, about those learning materials. And then the last thing I wanna talk about kind of in a learning materials context is um, the computer science standards and the Finch and where we are with that. So as I mentioned, uh, the Finch was just released in December. As part of my preparation for this webinar, I did a crosswalk with the Georgia CS standards. Um, so I'm going to click through to that. And you can see it's just a Google doc at this point. Um, but basically, I've gone through and looked at all of the standards that you've created, some of which I noticed overlap with CSTA standards and some of which do not, and then kind of listed the standards that I believe um, work or are easy to kind of hit by using the Finch. And so, you know, for grades K to two, here's the standard. In the, in the case of K to two, pretty much any Finch activity is going to meet, meet these standards. But once you get to grades three, three to five, and especially six to eight, I noticed that um, there are some standards that we can hit, but not with every activity. It's not, it's not just something that you learn automatically by using a robot. It may be something about like a specific activity. So organizing and presenting data uh, to highlight relationships. Well, you can actually graph data with the Finch, and we have a couple of activities that do that, and you can analyze data. You can, you know, you can take the sensor data and do some analysis on that. And we have, we have activities that show that. 
but it's not like you automatically do that regardless of what Finch activity you're doing. Um, so here is the link to that uh, Georgia CS standards. And then the other um, list here is the CSTA standards. These we're going to put on our website very soon, um, but they're still in Google Doc form. Um, and it's just the same kind of crosswalk. So same understanding of that. If you go to our website, there's also a standards page here in which you can see how the Finch meets the Common Core Math and ELA standards and also the uh, like ISTE technical standards. So we'll be adding CSTA on here pretty pretty soon. OK, so um, oop, I thought I had, sorry. I thought I had put the Finch loan program right here. Uh, you can just talk about it. Yeah, I can, I can move forward to it and then move back. It's fine. Everybody can see a little preview. There you go. All right, so Aparna, do you want to, why don't you talk about the loan program since you run it? Yeah, so I've posted a few um, times in the chat that we have a demo program, which is the second link here and the link is in the chat. So the demo program is any US educator at any time can borrow the Finch and or the Hummingbird Robotics Kit to try out for free for 60 days. And um, honestly, if you borrow it for 60 days and you need a little bit of extra time, we're very flexible. Um, and the, the hidden bonus to the demo program is that if you like the robot and you want to end up buying it, you get a 10% discount on your demo. So that you're not supposed to know until you actually get the demo. But um, so it's a great way to try it out, see if it works for your classroom, see if it will fit in with the standards, the curriculum, anything else that you were considering, compare it to other products, et cetera. So the demo program is for anyone at any time and is completely free. We send it to you, we give you a label to send it back to us when you're done. But we recognize that even, there's plenty of teachers and plenty of schools out there, even if you try a free demo, you do not have the resources to buy the robots, even if you think they're fantastic. And, you know, our mission is really about deep and joyful learning for all students. And so we recognize that there are situations where there are students who are not going to be able to access our products because of the educational systems that they're in. And we want to make our products available to all students. So we have a Finch Robot Loan Program. So we've been loaning out Finches for free uh, since 2013. And uh, we have loaned them to every state in the US. Um, we've reached over 200,000 students with that program. Um, it's fantastic. And we are going to convert that program completely over to Finch Robot 2.0. So right now it is Finch Robot 1.0 um, for the next school year. So right now we are not loaning out the new Finch Robot 2. If you've heard of the Finch Robot 1 and are interested in borrowing that, you are welcome to borrow that this spring or this summer. If you are running a camp or summer school or something else this summer, we are going to start to pilot the loan program with Finch 2s this summer. And then in August, we will release our loan program application for the school year. Normally, we release that in the spring the previous school year, but with all the changes that teachers are having to deal with every day, it seems like now, uh, we did not want teachers to have to think ahead and plan for a school year that right now is still uncertain. So we decided to postpone the application period until summer when hopefully people will be a little more certain on whether they'll be back in the classroom, which classroom they'll be in, how many kids they'll have. Um, so we are very excited to switch the loan program over to the Finch Robot 2.0. And like I said, you should get in touch with us. I will post the loan program page in the chat. I'll post the demo, pay, demo page in the chat also. Um, and if you're on our social media, on our mailing list, if you're in touch with us at all, you will hear lots about the loan program coming. Um, 
So we would love to have applications. We've loaned lots of finches in Georgia. So we'd love the schools in Georgia. And um, so we're very excited to bring this program to you. Do you have any um, tips for what constitutes a good application? Yeah. So. Um, this year with the Finch Robot 2.0, we anticipate the program being very oversubscribed. So we anticipate not having enough robots to loan to everyone who is interested. Um, we definitely, definitely want to reach underrepresented students. So if your school has a very high free and reduced lunch percentage, if you serve a lot of um, black and brown students, um, other underrepresented groups. We love to hear about that. So how you are reaching groups that are historically underserved in CS um, makes for a very strong program. We also have a lot of schools who end up doing community events. So they'll have a STEM night or a STEM weekend and they'll invite parents and siblings and other people in so that they get a little bit more exposure with the robots. Um, people partner with local libraries. So anything you can do to show that you are using these robots to really, um, you know, bring deep and joyful learning to, to people, to kids who would not normally have this opportunity um, is what we like to see. Just to add to that, my favorite stories from the previous loan participants are when the loan catalyzed something more permanent, right? A loan is temporary by its nature, but when that loan created, you know, so much enthusiasm that next year, suddenly there was a new computer science class or suddenly computer science enrollment doubled or something like that, we have seen that kind of thing happen. Um, and so I, I am hopeful like that, that you can use these loans at, as a way to kind of bootstrap something that becomes a permanent fixture of the community. Um, okay. All right, so let's talk about remote robots, which I'm gonna go back a whole bunch. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that, uh, that I have some robots here that I want you all to program and we've got about 15 minutes left. So I'll try to go fast through the explanation. Um, but the idea of remote robots is, you know, I have these robots, you're in Georgia, how can I make it so that you can program my robots? Um, we've actually seen two different implementations since, you know, we went to this kind of remote hybrid crazy world of, of crazy new world of education. Um, one is this remote robots idea where you have the robots, you want your students to program them, they don't have robots. The other is one-to-one -one robotics, which is where you and your students may not be in the same classroom, but everybody's got a robot and you need to teach them effectively. And we actually have tools for both of these scenarios. So we decided to develop these remote robots in part because I didn't feel like a simulator was, was something that the world needed right now. A robot simulator is not that much more compelling in my view than just going to code.org or Scratch. I think physical computing has to be physical. Um, and then there is an equity piece, like you do not, this is an efficient way to use robotics, right? Because you don't need as many robots per student in order for the kids to use them. Uh, it works, this technology that you'll be using works with both um, the Finch and with the Hummingbird kit. And it actually works with all versions of the Finch and all versions of the Hummingbird kit. So how it works is I'm going to send you a link to a programming environment in that programming environment, it's blocks-based. So you will have blocks that control the robot. When you click on one of those blocks, it sends a message over the internet to a blocks program that I'm running here on a local laptop. And when uh, that project receives your message, it will move the robot via Bluetooth connection. So we can do three finches connected to one computer. I have six finches, I have two computers. So that's how, how this is gonna work. It actually goes in, uh, in reverse also. So I, if I have a sensor on my Finch, that gets sent to the local project and that gets sent about once a second to your project. So you can actually see what the Finch's sensors are registering or reading. So what this means is that remote robots are actually Internet of Things devices. So if you've ever needed to explain the Internet of Things or needed an example, here's one. Okay, so we're gonna program the robots in the studio by following this link. 
And um, Aparna, I'll put that in the chat also, but here's the link and let me just, so this page is sort of an overview resource page for you um, with some instructions. It has an orientation video, which I'm about to run through. It has um, some specific links to tutorials that you can use to learn how to move the finch. You know, these are some of the tutorials, specific ones that I showed you earlier in the SNAP step-by-step um, -step lessons. And then it has some suggested activities that work well in a remote robots context. So if I click on this link to the finches, that's gonna take me to the programming environment that we can use to program the robots. Now there's quite a few people in the session and I only have six robots. So my suggestion here is that people kind of assemble programs, connect and then disconnect when they're done running to, to give somebody else a try. So the way I would do that, or the way to do that is you know, I'll show you how to connect. You press the C key or click on this set of blocks. It's gonna say trying to connect to Finch A, trying to connect to Finch B. Okay, we've connected to Finch B, great. So that's this guy. And in fact, I will switch my view over to the remote robots view. And of course that made me lose my, oh, somebody's already, already going, that's great. Here we go, sorry, I lost my tab. Um, so, so I'm connected to Finch B, somebody else is connected to Finch A and already programming it, which is great. So once I'm connected, there's actually a little mini program, which if you're making this at home, you can actually decide what your students start with. But this little mini program um, repeats six times, it moves the robot forward and then turns it right. So it's actually drawing a hexagon. Um, it's going 60 degrees. So that's, there's my robot going. Uh, I have some other blocks down here. So Finch tail, Finch beak, uh, Finch play note. These are output blocks that control the tail LED, the beak LED and the note. Um, all right, so we've got Finch C going already, great. Um, so if you've done scratch programming or block space programming, I think a lot of this probably looks familiar. I am going to disconnect to give other people a chance, but I, but I still wanna do a little bit more explanation here. So um, in the motion category, the Finch blocks are at the bottom of that category. So don't use move 10 steps or turn 15 degrees, use like Finch move forward, turn right, Finch turn right. In the looks category, if you're wanting more LED blocks, they're down here also. Uh, in sound, the Finch buzzer, again, Finch play note is down at the bottom. And then sensing at the bottom of the sensing category, you'll find your sensors. If you're looking for things like control structures or if statements, there's the control category. And the other category you may need if you wanna do like a Boolean operator, that's in the operators category. So in the green one. So those are, the, those are probably the ones that you'll be using in the next few minutes. Um, like I said, I'm disconnected right now from a robot, but I can still alter my program, right? I can still be changing this. And then if I want to um, see what it looks like, I can reconnect and then, you know, it's gonna try to connect to Finch A, B. Okay, there we go, Finch B. And now I'm, I'm moving my robot and running my program. And then whenever I'm, I, I think, oh, well, that was good. It looks good. I wanna do some more things. I can go back and disconnect and then you know do whatever iterate on on my program as needed. Um, so to disconnect, you want to hit the X key or this set of blocks over here. So when X key press disconnect from robot. Um, and that's it. I'm going to turn off my screen share so that the big view. And apart, I think you should turn off your or I'll double click to maximize the video here, so you guys can see the robots. Feel free to ask questions in the chat um, and yeah, enjoy, play around with it for the next you know, five or 10 minutes. It looks like we've got some robots still available, F, D, E, all still available. So definitely, uh, yeah, feel free to connect. All right, B is moving backwards. Try to spread things out a little. A lot of this remote robot stuff is being the robot robot wrangler. 
Tom, do you want to put a marker in one of them so people can see some? Drawings? Oh yeah. Uh, I was there. It is. Okay, I got my my red marker. I'm gonna put it in B since B is moving. So, got a marker in here now. This is a Crayola um, paintbrush style marker that is washable. And the surface that I'm using here um, for my arena is just uh, it's whiteboard material. I picked it up from Home Depot. I think it was like twelve dollars per per two by four foot square. So it's pretty useful for this kind of thing. Anyone have any uh, questions or yeah, feel free to unmute or put questions in the chat. So like Tom said, the remote robots technology is still less than a year old because we he started creating it uh, once the pandemic shut everything down. And so um, it has been constantly evolving over the last year. And we do have instructions on how to make your own remote Finch robot. I posted them in the chat. We also have similar instructions for making your own remote hummingbird robot. And we have been so impressed that there have been several educators this year that have really dove straight into this um, and tried it out as early as last spring. So last April, right after the Hummingbird Remote Robots were created, we had a teacher do this with her middle school students. Um, so she would have them design and then she would build what they told her to design to build. And so sometimes they would learn that their instructions were not complete um, and would have problems. And then so she would build these robots for them and put them online so they could program their own creations remotely. Um, this winter, we had a AP computer science teacher try out the remote finches for the first time with Java, sort of immediately after Tom had created that technology. So most of the teachers have been using the same technology you're using right now to program, which is blocks based. But we had some requests for text based uh, for the Finch. So Tom made that possible. And we had a great high school teacher in uh, Virginia try that out. Um, so so teachers are, are doing it. They're working remotely with their students. We hope that you're back in person with your students completely next year. But it's still uh, a great opportunity for you know, snow days or other opportunities where you can't be in person with people. Mm -hmm. Nice. Tom, we had a great question in the chat about using the remote programming later on. Now, yeah. this setup we have in our studio is only, we only turn it on when we're doing these kinds of presentations. But what about teachers who want to build their own remote robots and have their students program them um, all the time? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a couple of different options for you. One is uh, with the Hummingbird kits, we, I set up five remote robots at my house that are on uh, live streams, always on. And so, uh, Parna, you can, you can link that from the chat, but those are available 24 seven or as close to 24 seven as I can, as I can get it. Uh, so I try to keep them running pretty much all the time. Um, so that's something that you're, you can send your students to. In fact, I've seen uh, students do that. Like I've seen uh, teachers tell a class to go because I can tell when all of the robots are suddenly like pop to life and start doing things, I figure that's probably a classroom um, 
going to the uh, remote robots page. As for how to set this up yourself, so the, the challenge with doing it like 24 seven with finches is that, you know, the finches are on batteries. So really what you could do is if you had an arena and, um, you know, so that, or a pen so that the robots can't get out. Uh, if you had a webcam and you put it above it, sort of like this arena is, is set up, and then you used um, your school's video chat platform, you know, like my kids are using a lot of Microsoft Teams, um, but, you know, maybe Google Meet or whatever, so that they can just go into this session so that they can see the robots. Um, that would be a way to at least have it on like during the school day, for example. Um, and we have seen teachers do that. Uh, like I, I know of one teacher using 12 hummingbird robots that they built with something like 600 middle school students. And he's got four laptops because like I said, you know, it's one laptop for every three remote robots. Um, so he's got four laptops, all with cameras pointing at the robots. And then the kids can like, just log into a random, like the video call is basically like always running. So they just log into that video call. And because it's behind a school network, there aren't the kind of concerns of, of having, you know, outsiders hop into the video calls or anything like that. So it's definitely possible. I believe we've got like, two or three minutes left. So if you haven't yet programmed a robot or you have a, you know, a program that you want to run there, I do see a couple of free robots. So give it a try. Um, let's see. So yes, Lucas, that's the Finch Blocks interface. That's the, um, the web app. So for uh, if you were using it with a student on a Chromebook or in the future, a Windows or Mac laptop, that's the link you would use. On uh, tablets, we actually have a native app that you would, you know, install from the App Store. Uh, but that's for using Finch Blocks with like kindergarten to second or third grade students. And Lucas, I'm going to post the page from our website um, for Finch Blocks, and you'll see that it gives you a choice when you get started. If you're on Chromebooks, it's going to end up taking you to this link. And if you're on iOS or Fire or Android, it will take you to links to download those apps. <laughs> Someone playing, playing with the tones. And one, one other thing I want to say about the remote robots, um, the setup instructions, you know, for both Finch and Hummingbird, because they like, because the way that it works is through this programming environment called NetsBlocks, which is all blocks based, uh, it does not require you to be a, you know, software developer in order to set it up. If you've, if you've got some intermediate blocks programming experience, that's roughly what you need in order to set one of these up on your own. Um, so teachers have told me, you know, it takes them maybe a half hour to an hour on average to kind of get, get everything set up. Um, so it's definitely uh, in the range of possible, I guess. And we also have a couple of webinars, one, with, one about Finch, one about Hummingbird, where we go through how to make your own remote robot. The one about the Finch um, that we ran just uh, at the beginning of March actually uh, we have a teacher on kind of showing her arena and Finch setup that she built. She built one at home and at also one at school. Um, so yeah, so those webinars are also helpful. I think if you're if you want to explore this further. But you know, we also hope that next year your kids can program these in person. So uh, like the Finch was originally designed to be hands on and used in person. So there's lots of uh, lots of use cases and, and ways to use it in person also.
Uh, I like what you're doing with Robot C, whoever's programming it. I see like a zigzag drive or something. <laughs> Tom, we've got a great question from someone who's going to be using Chromebooks with K through five. Mm -hmm. And they're, the kids are going to be rotating through his room during the day. So he asked, could I use the same class set of Chromebooks and Finches and switch back and forth between the types of programming used by the students? Um, yes, with one exception. So, so there's kind of two ways. There's sort of the, the way to program it with make code and everything else. So if you're not using make code, you can switch between, for example, using it with Finch blocks um, for your younger students and Snap or, uh, or Bird blocks for your older students um, without any problems. Um, with make code, you would, you would be downloading the software or the firmware to the robot, and then you can switch it back to you know, a Finch blocks, like a Bluetooth tethered mode. Um, but you'd have to go and download kind of the special firmware back onto the Finch. So, I mean, that procedure takes 15 seconds, but you know, if you're, I, I know sometimes the time between classes is very tight. So uh, maybe you won't have time for that. Um, but yeah, you can definitely go between Finch blocks and Snap, which is probably what I would recommend for K through five anyway. I think it's 152. I'm. Am I right that the sessions are supposed to be 50 minutes? <laughs> are we going over it accidentally? Yes, I think we might be, but we are happy to stay here. Um, people can unmute if they have questions or put them in the chat. We're also happy for people to keep programming the finches, but we don't want to hold you up from what is next on the schedule either, so. Yeah, we'll keep it running for like, uh, let's say until two o'clock, because I know you do have to go to your sessions at two. So, and we try to make the URLs on the website intuitive. So Lucas, you were asking between, you know, can you switch between Finch blocks, which is icon based, and maybe a, you know, more complicated blocks based programming language. Tom suggested Snap. I put the link here for Finch blocks, which is, you know, birdbraintechnologies.com backslash Finch backslash Finch blocks. If you wanted to get the equivalent page for Snap, you would change that word Finch blocks to Snap. Same with Python, Java, MakeCode, whatever your programming language. But so if you wanted to switch back and forth just from the materials on our website, that's where you would go. And thank you so much, everyone. I know people will keep uh, dropping out, but we really appreciate you taking the time with us to learn about our new Finch. Um, we hope you will try it out. We hope you will spread the word. We're a tiny team, just six people. So this is as much marketing as we ever do. Um, and, and Tom and I are, are not particularly good at marketing. So we would love it if you thought this was exciting to tell your educator friends, ask them to try a demo, um, or write us and give us suggestions. If you have something that you need um, that we can make for you, we will do our best to try and, and make it. In fact, the Finch Blocks app for Chromebooks um, was a request from a teacher. We hadn't made it yet because the UI on the Chrome end was very clunky. And we thought, oh, this isn't gonna be good for kindergarten kids. And we had teachers write us and we said, oh, but it's gonna look clunky and they said we don't care we want it make it and so we made it um so we really will take your feedback seriously yeah yeah thank you everybody and hi pk <laughs> it's uh good to see you around
Yeah, so if people have questions about implementing our products in real time, they can ask PK. Yeah, that's true. They don't need to believe us. They can listen to someone who is not uh, employed by Birdbrain Technologies. That's great. And he has a wealth of information and knowledge. So, Thanks, John. We got your email. Someone will get right back to you. We appreciate your support. And just so people know, we are we are really tiny. We're six people. So when you send emails, we see them. So, uh, you know, when someone's writing back to you, uh, it, it is a real person and it's one of very few. So we, when we say we take your feedback seriously, we mean we literally, me and Tom, take it. We get the feedback and we take it seriously. And we still do have a few people online. So if you have questions, let us know. I noticed the inches have stopped moving. So perhaps none of you are programming. All right, folks, I think we can call it. There's a couple of you left, but uh, again, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, hope this was fun and educational. Um, and yeah, have a, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you so much for inviting us.